Welcome to AEI and our virtual policy event, Regulation and the Future of Crypto Assets. We are honored to begin today's event with a conversation with Sen Senator Cynthia Lummis, a thought leader on crypto asset regulation. Senator Lummis' remarks will be followed by a panel discussion of, on the regulatory issues created by the growth of the crypto, crypto asset markets. Our expert panel includes Caitlin Long, the founder and CEO of Custodia Bank, one of the two special purpose crypto banks that have been chartered under Wyoming state banking laws, Una McDonald, a senior advisor at Crypto Capital, and Tom Vartanian, executive director, financial technology and cybersecurity center. Cynthia Loomis was sworn into the United States Senate on January 3rd, 2021, becoming the first woman to serve as United States Senator from the great state of Wyoming. She's a genuine cowgirl, having grown up on a ranch in Laramie County, Wyoming. She served eight years as Wyoming State Treasurer and 14 years as a member of the Wyoming State House and Senate. She was elected to Congress in 2006 and represented Wyoming in the House until 2016, when she returned to run her family's ranch. She has a well-earned reputation as a no-nonsense conservative and principal policymaker. Welcome, Senator Lemus. Thank you, Paul, and thanks, AEI, for allowing me to be with you today. Thanks for putting this on. My pleasure, my pleasure. So uh, we're going to do some some uh, questions and answers here. And so uh, the first one is a sort of just a general question for people who um, maybe do not understand crypto asset markets or, or why they exist. Um, there, there was an interesting quote I, I saw last week um, when people were reporting on the Coinbase issue or Coinbase uh, uh, had had the value of market value Coinbase dropped quite a bit and the and the in their SEC filing they uh, revealed that accounts might not be segregated and one of the one of the wag common commentators in, the, in, in after the article said anyone foolish enough to pay real money for the privilege of moving nothing around inside nowhere to accomplish no purpose deserves to lose the real money which i thought was a was a clever quote now can can you maybe take a little time to explain the actual economic value that crypto assets uh, give, you know, what's, what is their economic purpose? What, what innovations do crypto asset markets provide that, that are not possible to achieve using more traditional financial sector products? Well, digital assets take advantage of innovative technology on the blockchain and allow for cheaper and faster uh, conveyance of valuable assets uh, among people. When you think that over 7% of this country's uh, GDP uh, is made up of uh, the costs of financial transactions uh, and the financial uh, sector's uh, involvement in all kinds of uh, financial transactions, uh, finding ways to make it cheaper and faster and finding ways to make people that are unbanked or underbanked, uh, able to send peer-to-peer -peer, uh, value to each other uh, in real time uh, and for no cost is going to be a game changer uh, for economies, not just in this country, but elsewhere in the world. So those are some of the advantages that uh, cryptocurrencies have. Uh, of course, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum make up over 60% of all uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, so they're the big players. Um, and uh, it's important that people know uh, that they're transparent. At least if I send you a uh, Bitcoin, uh, it is apparent to everyone uh, that one Bitcoin has moved from one wallet to another. They just don't know who the sender or the receiver is. So it's a transparent, on the ledger, peer-to-peer, -peer, decentralized um, asset platform. So by decentralized, I mean there's no creator, uh, there's no uh, holder, uh, and um, it is... For that reason, uh, not involving a trusted third party. You don't have to trust anybody. Uh, so these are some of the advantages uh, of blockchain cryptocurrencies. 
Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And um, I think I think the blockchain, um, you think it's fair to say that the it the, the real potential innovation here is is the use of a of a some type of public distributed ledger way to to transfer value from one person to another where, where, where you have this open public blockchain that 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 really is um the heart of the innovation or or the, the primary innovation is that you think that's fair to say i do think that's fair to say paul for example we're seeing instances where in a country like el salvador uh, where a huge part of that nation's GDP is made up of remittances uh, of people who are working uh, outside of El Salvador, such as, let's use the example of a son who is working in the United States. He can send over his phone um, money in the form of Bitcoin uh, to his parents in El Salvador. They can receive it on their phone in real time without transaction fees, without having to go to Western Union and pay a big fee and risk uh, having those monies uh, stolen. Uh, it's peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, it's safe when it's between peer-to-peer. -peer. The other thing I would point out, especially with regard to your mentioning about the uh, concerns about Coinbase uh, and people finding out that um, their assets were commingled, there's a, there's a saying within the industry that everyone needs to commit to memory. Not your keys, not your coin. In other words, if you don't keep uh, the, the password or the key to get to your asset and you surrender that key or that password to someone else, technically that means it's their coin, not your coin. So when we are dealing with a custodian or um, an exchange, uh, this is something where consumer protections uh, need to uh, be disclosed uh, more clearly from the get-go and that participants who hold money on an exchange or a, um, uh, a holder of their assets, a custodian, knows that they need to be the keeper of their own keys in order to be sure that it is their cryptocurrency, their coin. So, I mean, a little bit, but that, that's an interesting point. I mean, in, in securities markets, of course, um, we, we developed rules uh, uh, for custodians of securities and we have this, and CIPIC, uh, Securities Investor Protection Corporation, that you can keep uh, you can keep your stocks in in street name at a broker, and if the broker fails, then you're you're insured to get your securities back up to a certain um, up to a certain level. Is that is that something that um, I'm jumping a little bit ahead? But is that something that we should consider uh, in in legislation mandating something like that? Uh, for, for crypto exchanges, is that are, are are we are we going to move in that direction where we adopt protections like that in in, in the crypto uh, asset world? Well, certainly, if uh, a digital asset is considered a security, uh, the SEC, which would then be assigned assigned regulatory jurisdiction, uh, has a, a plethora of regulations to protect consumers. Uh, Bitcoin and uh, probably Ethereum are commodities mm -hmm. by definition and would fall under the jurisdiction of uh, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Uh, so uh, depending on how an asset is defined, either as a security because of the Howey test or mm -hmm. as a commodity, uh, we need to make sure that the law uh, recognizes that consumer protection needs to be in place for each. Okay. Um, let me move on a little bit. Uh, it, it, I think it's more than a rumor. I know you're working on comprehensive legislation. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, one of the issues that sort of is befuddled crypto asset regulation or definitions um, you know, it's not always completely clear if a coin is, as you just mentioned, a security, a commodity or something else. 
So um, are, is the legislation you're working on, is that going to help straighten this issue out, uh, clarify it? If you could tell us a little bit about that. Yes, it will. So um, next week, Senator Gillibrand and I intend to uh, send out um, our final draft legislation for another month of comment uh, publicly before we formally file it um, as uh, a bill uh, for passage uh, here in the U.S. Senate. So we want everyone to use next week and the month thereafter uh, to get us additional feedback to make sure that uh, we've covered all the points that people feel are necessary to create regulatory clarity. Among the most important components of that bill are definitions of the different kinds of assets that will help put them in different regulatory buckets and hopefully help clearly define not only who the regulator is, uh, but what kind of reporting requirements might be uh, necessary depending on what regulator uh, it falls under. So um, this is actually very much related. You know, one of the categories, of course, is private, private stable coins, but I think we all, anybody who sort of follows this area knows that there's different flavors of, of private stable coins. Um, how does your law, is it going to make a distinction between what um, Senator uh, Toomey's bill would call, you know, pay, payment stable coins, uh, private stable coins versus other kinds of stable coins like algo, algorithmic uh, stable coins, crypto back ones that are inherently probably riskier than 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 the kind of stable coin that uh, Senator Toomey would 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 have in his law or would recognize as a payment stable coin. Maybe you could uh, speak to to us a little bit about that because his law his law doesn't deal with um, algos and other kinds of flavors of stable coins. Yeah, and and last week we did see uh, an issue develop uh, with a algorithmic stable coin. I think it's going to be very important that for consumer protection, consumers turn to asset backed stable coins. So they could be there could be two ways they could be regulated. One is uh, as existing financial institutions that are insured under the FDIC. The second way would be for an asset backed stable coin to be 100 percent backed by hard assets. Uh, that uh, the consumer knows uh, will be there uh, to uh, assure uh, that its value is indeed stable. Uh, so uh, there are companies, accounting firms, currently in existence in the United States that can monitor that a stable coin is 100% asset backed and can do it in real time. Uh, they update every 10 minutes or less to ensure or assure uh, the stablecoin user uh, that the 100% asset backed uh, guarantee they're getting uh, is indeed a fact. And if it were ever to fall below 100% asset backed, you'd know it in a heartbeat. Uh, and the uh, issuer of the stablecoin uh, that is backed by, you know, a, a, a U.S. dollar uh, or fiat currency uh, would indeed have the asset backing uh, to shore up any run uh, on a payment or asset backed stablecoin. So this is sort of the same mechanism uh, that we use for exchange traded funds, where you have uh, you have third party firms valuing. What, what's in an ETF portfolio at very high frequency. Um, so if, if, if that's your way you envision these 100% back stable coins, uh, asset back stable coins moving, that, that would be um, a, 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 tougher, a, a tougher standard than Senator Toomey's, which was, I think, uh, they have to put out monthly uh, uh, statements of, of what's in their uh, backing, and then that they have to be 
uh, I think audited by a firm every every quarter or something like that. So you would you would anticipate higher frequency monitoring, um, and um, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I think um, well, certainly the um, ability for real time monitoring that's much more frequent exists. Uh -huh. It will be up to lawmakers to determine uh, whether to require that that more high frequency. Uh, monitoring uh, it is either required or is permissive. Uh, so we'll be working with Senator Toomey and Senator Gillibrand and others who are interested in this topic to see what the appropriate legal standard is. And maybe what we'll do is make the legal standard be a floor. At a minimum, it has to be uh, a certain amount, uh, but uh, a higher standard uh, could be attained. You could encourage a, a higher standard. Yes. So um, pretty pretty soon I have to leave time for some audience questions. I wanted, though, you maybe if you could speak a little bit to decentralized autonomous organizations or, or, or DAOs or DAOs or how, however you say that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are sort of corporations that are just computer code. They don't have balance sheets. They don't have management necessarily. They don't own any assets necessarily except computer code. How do we? How do you envision that these get um, recognized by the legal system? I know that's a big issue with smart contracts and the future of Web 3.0. Can can you give us a couple of minutes and speak to how that that will all work? Well, how do we fit this into our, our legal system? Well, Paul, uh, my home state of Wyoming uh, was the first state to create LLCs, and they were later. Uh, adopted by other states and uh, are easily recognized all over the country, of course, uh, because the pass-through entity recognition uh, of uh, LLCs was recognized by the IRS. Something kind of similar has happened with these DAOs in that my state of Wyoming has by law recognized DAOs, but uh, my state requires uh, that there be some filings uh, to, and that they conform uh, to some regulatory norms in the state of Wyoming. I understand that the state of Tennessee may have recently adopted uh, an approach that's based on Wyoming's law. So uh, we are taking at what you described, which is a DAO which really has no uh, regulatory uh, requirements, uh, and we are requiring some disclosure, some reporting, some uh, recognition uh, that would provide for some uh, responsible party uh, to, uh, uh, to be behind them. Uh, there's even a Dow in Wyoming, for example, that has purchased a hard asset in real estate. Uh, so uh, as Wyoming continues to uh, develop a state-of-the-art regulatory regime, uh, for DAOs, uh, they will be in a position where other states can adopt them uh, and the federal government can recognize them uh, with some certainty as to their uh, status. So, so just to just to guess a little bit, you're going to kind of borrow some of uh, some of the ideas from Wyoming, and and maybe we'll see that in your legislation when it comes out, your draft your draft legislation and. I'll, I'll look forward to reading that. Um, I, I need to open it up to see if we can get a few audience questions in because our time is short today. Um, uh, the audience, you can um, email your questions to John Kearns at AEI.org or on Twitter. Um, you can see it on the screen there. Um, be great if we could get a question or two out of the audience. Okay, I don't see one yet. Um, let me go on then with what am I? Um, so should banks, I think you mentioned, banks should be able to issue private stable coins. Do you, do you have a view whether they should do this um, in the insured depository institution or um, do, do we need uh, a separate uh, bank charter where um, 
if they're fully backed 100% by high quality liquid assets, um, do, do, we, do we need to impose the entire set of Basel type capital requirements on, on stable co- on, on, on a bank that is, it, is chartered only to issue stable coins? Or is it, do we need a new type, special type of bank charter, maybe something um, that the OCC has talked about? Uh, do you have views on that? Well, probably the right answer is a special purpose bank charter for stable coin issuance. Uh, with tailored capital and holding company supervision requirements that make sense. For example, a special bank charter could also access the payment system, have bankruptcy certainty and regulatory supervision that isn't present in today's uh, stablecoin markets. So you want to maintain 100% backing of a stablecoin with cash, treasury, bonds, or other safe assets to prevent run risk, Um, you know, deposit insurance is designed for a bank that lends out 90% of its assets and keeps the other 10% in reserve by comparison. So the capital structure for deposit insurance is also structured. So you have to keep high levels of capital to account for credit risks, uh, capital levels that don't make sense for a 100% reserve bank. So on the hand, uh, deposit insurance itself is risky for a stablecoin issuer because it would allow them to land. And, and on the other hand, the capital requirements for a stablecoin issuer with deposit insurance would be prohibit would be prohibitive to issuing a stablecoin. Yeah. So, so it, it sounds like we do need a special special purpose uh, bank uh, charter. Um, we're, we're quickly coming up on uh, on uh, four o'clock. Okay, I have a, a question here um, from the audience. The regulation of stablecoin has become quite controversial, such as with regard to Tether and concerns about it not being able to maintain its dollar peg. Given that stablecoins are comparable in many regards to money market mutual funds, including a commitment not to break the buck, why shouldn't the SEC regulate stable coins in the same manner that it regulates money market mutual funds, specifically in terms of the types and maturities of the asset backing the outstanding stable coin? That's from our audience. Hmm, that's a great question. Um, and, and I don't have an off the cuff answer for that. Uh, but um, I, th- I think that the questioner makes some really good points. Uh, and it's something that Senator Gillibrand and I uh, need to consider uh, as we're dealing with the stablecoin aspect of our legislation, and Senator Toomey as well. So uh, let me just say that there are components of um, Senator Gillibrand's and my bill that deal with um, definitions, with banking, uh, with uh, who regulates, uh, with consumer protection, Uh, with systemic risk uh, and with taxation, uh, as well as some other issues. So um, the question you raise is such a good question that I'm hoping that that's the kind of person that will really take a hard look at our bill. You'll have an opportunity starting next week to do that. And we're going to put it out there in draft form for discussion purposes Uh, So people such as the questioner who raise really good questions uh, that I've not fully contemplated can spend 30 days helping us uh, get this bill in in as good a form as we possibly can before we actually file it. Uh, There is some enthusiasm uh, in both political parties uh, and by the regulated community uh, to get some regulations in place so people understand the rules of the road here. Uh, You've got innovators that are way ahead of policymakers in terms of uh, their need uh, for uh, a regulatory framework uh, that is clear uh, and that helps them understand the parameters in which their innovations will fit. And then um, another component of our legislation will be for new technologies. Uh, 
that we can't even contemplate today, Paul, but that are uh, in being beta tested right now, but that don't fit neatly under the OCC for banking or the uh, Commodity Futures Trading Commission for commodities or the SEC for securities. Um, there will be sort of this uh, oversight entity uh, that will be created to look at new technologies that don't neatly fit within a certain regulatory framework uh, that already exists. Uh, so uh, we can continue uh, to incorporate innovation in this space into our uh, well understood regulatory framework. Well, that's great. Um, very, very interesting. I, I know that um, there, there's a lot of work going on uh, in terms of uh, uh, ways that people can um, get certified for being uh, uh, good, good agents, good acting agents, and yet still maintain an anonymity in these markets uh, you know, to, to meet AML rules and, and all these things, which are still in the in the formative stages and are definitely going to, you know, uh, come up in the future and, and, and we'll need, we'll need people to look at that for sure. We'll need, uh, agencies. So we're coming up on, on four o'clock and I want to be, uh, very, uh, mindful of your time. And I, I want to thank you very much for, for joining us today and, and, and having a conversation with me about this, uh, very, uh, important issue, uh, the, uh, the regulation of, uh, of the, crypto assets, digital assets. Well, um, thank you, Paul. And you have a really knowledgeable panel coming up when you name the names of the people on your on your panel. I know that you're going to get some additional insights that are really helpful to the discussion. Uh, those are some of the people to which we've turned for guidance on crafting this legislation. We'll, we hope they and others will continue to weigh in uh, as we approach the next five pivotal weeks. Uh, in the development of Senator Gillibrand and my legislation. Well, thank you very much. And we'll do our best to, to, to weigh in with our comments. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. So next is Caitlin. Is Caitlin Long available? Hi there. Caitlin, nice welcome. Nice to see you again. Yes, thank Wait, you. My pleasure. Yes, good to see you. I'm glad, glad you could join us today. So, Caitlin, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, if you have some prepared remarks to make, and then um, after you, will be followed by Una, and then then Tom, and then we'll come back with some Q and A at the end. So, Caitlin, the floor is yours. Okay, terrific. Uh, following up on what my home state senator Lummis just laid out, uh, the state of Wyoming really has been thinking about these very issues. What is the appropriate way to regulate? digital assets and the appropriate way to plug them into the traditional financial services system. And since 2018, it has set up upon that very task of figuring out what is the, the safe and sound manner in which these two asset classes can coexist. A lot of folks from the traditional industry, and I came from the traditional industry, I spent 22 years on Wall Street and, and really dug into the settlement system and operational issues. It's amazing how few people actually engage with the operational and settlement risks in the financial system and realize how much fault tolerance has been built into the system because of how few of the systems actually speak to each other and how they just are never in sync, never in sync with each other, especially in the securities markets, which is why we end up needing to have these fault tolerances. And these are long ago problems that, that could have been solved with technology, but weren't because there was a lot of institutional inertia. And in fact, actually the cynic would say a lot of folks were making a lot of money out of the fact, out of the reason that it takes two days to settle a stock trade. We, we've known probably for 20 years that it doesn't really take two days to settle a stock trade, but we're stuck with this legacy infrastructure of all these layers of intermediaries, each of whom has to settle in sequence. And the power of this technology is that, is that it's shared infrastructure. We are able to, to solve the duplication and reconciliation of information problem, which is that each of those intermediaries along that settlement chain 
have to duplicate and reconcile the very same data. It's not very green because each time that, uh, that transaction, that same data hits a different data center, it's taking electricity, consuming energy, to, to, to do nothing of, 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 of efficiency when if we figured out how to share that infrastructure, we could actually um, much more efficiently uh, update each other's ledgers. And ultimately, that's what this technology is. However, the, the, the traditional financial system is built on the systems of layered intermediaries and delayed net settlement. And here comes this brand new parallel system that is not built on intermediaries and is built on real-time gross settlement. That poses a lot of challenges to the status quo and the, the two really do not mix. Um, and I'll close by saying the, the most important aspect is that leverage and digital assets do not mix. I've been very outspoken uh, about the magnitude of games that have been played, the traditional Wall Street leverage games that work with with that traditional delayed net settlement system and with traditional asset classes. But digital assets are something very, very different. And in fact, just today, Dr. Manmohan Singh of the IMF, uh, 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 an economist with whom I've been collaborating for nearly a decade now, he and I published a new piece in risk.net about the liquidity needs of stable coins and conclude that there's really only one type of asset that can back a stable coin given the settlement characteristics of the system right now, and that's cash on deposit at the Fed. Even T-bills, which have the same credit risk as cash on deposit at the Fed, don't work because we witnessed the collapse within hours of a stable coin system last week. And the problem with T-bills right now is that they still settle next day, ergo, it's not possible to, to ensure sufficient liquidity same day for, uh, for stable coins. Uh, and, and therefore that is um, from a risk perspective, uh, the, the obvious answer, uh, as well as uh, the, the stable coin issuers to the extent they continue to become material in size, um, create collateral silos, which gum up the pledged collateral markets, therefore challenging um, the wholesale funding markets. We wanna try to create efficiency to, to deliver the end user something that's better, faster, cheaper, and more transparent than what they have today, but doing it in a manner that uh, that does not pose risk to the safety and soundness of the banking system. Can't hear you. <sighs> Paul, you're muted. Yeah. Still now, muted. I'm, now I'm unmuted. Thank you, Caitlin. I have a lot of questions. I'll come back with them later. Uh, Una McDonald, uh, I asked Una, welcome, and I, I asked you, you specifically to maybe tell us a little bit about how the European Union is treating crypto asset regulation, and um, hopefully uh, we'll learn something from that. Uh, right. Thank you. Um, first of all, comments on what Caitlin said. Uh, a good deal of experimental work has been carried out on um, wholesale settlements, Canada, Singapore, I'm sure you've looked at all of those projects and have found those to work successfully. And I agree with you, I think that that is um, appropriate for wholesale settlement. Um, as regards last week's collapse, it was an algorithmic stable coin linked to Luna which in turn was supposed to be linked to the American dollar, but not in the sense of holding reserves. Uh, in the, it was not, it's not a one-to-one -one exchange for the American dollar in the same way as Tether is, which is another point I want to come back to. As far as that one was concerned, it's very interesting because its reserves were built with other crypto assets. Bitcoin formed a large part of that. It was much more like a house of cards of crypto assets, whereas when one collapsed, the other collapsed and the other collapsed. And in a sense, they treat I think the algorithmic, I don't know.
Unfortunately, we're losing Una here. Um, John, can you contact her? Maybe we'll come back to Una, try to get reconnected there. Tom, you want to go ahead and uh, give us uh, give us a, a few minutes of what you your thoughts here? Sure, Paul. I'm happy to jump in. <laughs> um, so uh, let me come at this from a slightly different perspective, uh, given my experience as both a regulator and a practicing lawyer and an academician. Um, you know. We're 13 or 14 years down the course of of uh, cryptocurrency, and I'm really amazed at where we are, frankly. Um, and I'm a huge fan of innovation and technology moving financial products and financial delivery systems forward. But it's amazing to me, and I guess the, the crypto world must have the greatest lobbyists on the face of the planet. It's amazing to me that the crypto has really been dealt with with kid gloves up until this point. And I say that only because of the point we are at now and what the risks are to financial stability. And I'm all for allowing crypto to, to prove itself as the future of finance. But I think that's got to be done within the confines of financial stability and safety and soundness. And so far, I don't think we've scratch the surface of that. So let me let me give you a few examples. And and just start with one story. So I was at the OCC in 1977 when we approved the application by a national bank to establish the first ATM, automated teller machine in the United States. And we labored long and hard over that uh, opinion uh, and thought probably at that point it was going to be the pinnacle of technological development among financial institutions. Uh, and, you know, let me posit the following situation. Let's assume that Satoshi Nakamoto in 2009 worked for JP Morgan. And let's further assume that when he or she or whoever it is came up with Bitcoin, brought it to Jamie Dimon and said, I think the bank ought to do this. Now, what JP Morgan would have had to done is consult with its regulators, both at the national bank and the holding company level, depending on whether they wanted to do it out of the bank or as a special purpose or out of the holding company as a separate corporation under Reg Y. But that would have taken a lot of time and a lot of resources. And ask yourself the following question. And I want everybody in the audience to think about this. If it, hap if it had happened that way, how would Congress have reacted? How would the regulators have reacted? And how would consumers have reacted? I think we would have been in a slightly different place, if not a very different place, if, if history had unfolded that way. Um, and so here we are in 2022. And we've got essentially globally a $10 trillion market out there that is fundamentally unregulated. When I say unregulated, I'm a bank regulator type. So I'm, I'm talking about prudential regulation, not market regulation, as the SEC or the CFTC might do. I'm talking about prudential regulation, where the safety and soundness of the organization is guaranteed to the extent possible by having somebody else watch over what's happening. So we've got a $10 trillion industry. Now, I know everybody says it's two, $3 trillion because there's $3 trillion globally of crypto out there. But you have to remember, there's $3 trillion of crypto. There's $3 trillion of derivative securities built upon crypto. And there's another 3 to $4 trillion of leverage and margin that goes into the purchase of those, secu of those securities and that crypto. So that's a $10 trillion market, which is a big financial footprint. It'd be the biggest bank in the world if that were a bank, right? So we're talking about something that has a financial impact and a financial wallop to it. At the same time, we've got, and just let's just look at 2021. We had $14 billion of crypto stolen in, in 20, just in 2021, right? Through various hoaxes, heists, theft, and penetrations of the immutable blockchain, 
the blockchain that we're told is immutable. Now, I started doing digital signatures in the 90s when I was chair of the Cyberspace Law Committee and working with people around the world on that issue. And I know for sure what the engineers and the, and the, the computer engineers always told me was, it's only math. It's only math. It's always breakable, right? Anybody who tells you anything is immutable is not telling you the truth, right? Because it's all based on math. And as you and I were talking about previously, Paul, when we get to quantum computing, uh, it's going to wipe out every form of security we have today. Now, hopefully we'll be able to, to up the programs that we're working on now to be ready for quantum computing. But we're moving in, the, in a direction that is uh, largely unnerving. And so you, you overlay onto that the other thing that I've been thinking about, and which is the subject of my next book, The Unhackable Internet, and that is all of this is functioning on networks that are highly insecure in a world that is uh, extraordinarily dangerous, only made more dangerous by what's going on in Ukraine and the systematic attacks that the Russians are making around the world, particularly focused on Ukraine, Latvia, Lithuania, and places like that. Uh, and so I, I sort of look at this as a financial stability question in terms of the safety and soundness of, of the kinds of products that are being put out there. Because I think when you were talking to Senator Loomis, uh, you, you basically mentioned that quote, about people being foolish enough to spend real money to buy nothing, right? Because at the end of the day, the cryptocurrency, whether it's Bitcoin or whatever, and put aside, put aside stablecoin for a moment because that's its own issue. But at the end of the day, there's no intrinsic value. It operates just like a reverse poison pill. We used to do, as lawyers, a lot of poison pills for clients in the 80s and 90s. And the purpose of those was to drive the, 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 the price of the stock down by diluting it as the attacker bought more and more securities. He or she was diluted by the shareholders who were buying more and more stock at a cheaper price to dilute the attack. Well, crypto is going to work in the opposite direction because what's going to happen is because there's no intrinsic value, as people begin selling, there's no place to go in, except zero because there's no collateral to sell. There's nothing to liquidate. So it starts out as an incredibly high risk endeavor. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine. And it may be the future. But the problem is, is that we're dealing with something that is highly unregulated uh, and basically a, a, an analog of the, of the Wild West. So what does that mean in terms of where we go? And I want to I want to speak to a point that uh, Senator Loomis uh, spoke to a little bit, and that is the decentralized aspect of of all of this. And you know, she talked about it being cheaper. I'm not sure it is cheaper at the end of the day because while things move more efficiently and quicker at the front end, at the back end, when you want to convert your crypto into dollars, there's a cost to that. And there's also a cost for the creation of the crypto. So the cost question is out, is out there to be determined. But there's a fundamental point that, that everybody has talked to, and I think Caitlin talked to it too, and that's the decentralized uh, way in which these products, these digital assets work. And it may be, it may be that that's the greatest thing since sliced bread and that it is important for the future of financial products and financial delivery systems. But much like money market funds unnerved the banking business in the 1980s and played a role in the collapse of 3,000 banks between 1981 and 1992, decentralization of the current financial system can have a similar disruptive effect because you take out the trusted financial intermediaries, you take out the banks who are in the business of being uh, those trusted financial intermediaries, and you have changed the system dramatically. And so I think the point I would drop there and the, the, the suggestion I would make is I'm all for this happening, but we ought to know where we're going. We're, we ought to know where we're driving this car. And if just to say, well, let's get rid of all financial intermediaries because it'll be faster and cheaper. Number one, that's not true. And number two, 
if we're going to do that, we have to transition markets in an orderly way because we know what happens when we don't transition in an orderly way. We have financial dislocations, we have distress, and we have financial panics. And the money market fund experience in the 1980s is about a good example as I can offer for that. So where should we be going? I think in terms of making the world work for crypto and digital assets, we have a fundamental problem. And that is we're trying to regulate them with a system that is archaic, broken, and out of date. Right? The system was put in place between 1932 and 1940. Tell me anything about the marketplace today that looks like 1932 to 1940. Right? Those are the laws we're dealing with. In those, in between 1930 and 1940, the financial services system was made up 95% by commercial banks. Therefore, everything was centered on the regulation, prudential regulation of, of banks. Today, Banks are about 35% of the financial services system in this country. So think about it. We've got 100% of the regula prudential regulation in this country focused on 35% of the market risk in financial services companies. It makes no sense whatsoever. We have got to start regulating financial activities, and technology is begging us to do that because it's essentially dissembling the financial services business into pieces that can be that can be dealt with by technology efficiently and effectively. And we're still in the old world trying to put our armor on to go out to fight a war. It just doesn't make any sense. So number one, we've got to, regu we've got to, we've got to regulate financial activities, not financial charters. If you want to conduct an activity that is in the financial business and has a stability impact, you get regulated. You, you, don't get a free, you don't get a free pass. And frankly, if I were cryptocurrencies today, based on what's happened in the last week, I would be running towards regulation because that's where the safety and stability is ultimately, right? So the second thing is we've got too many regulators, right? You, if you're in the mortgage business in this country, and Caitlin will know this, if you're in the mortgage business to turn on the lights in the morning, you have to satisfy 150 to 180 regulators when you include all the federal regulators, all the state regulators. I mean, it's just it's just mind-numbing in terms, and I used to represent clients in this area, so I know how frustrating it is and how costly it is. But we've got to stop over-regulating, again, the 35% of the business and completely under-regulating all the other risks because what does that do? It forces all the risk in the system outside the regulatory system. We saw that in 2008 with subprime mortgages. How many of those mortgages emanated from companies that generated subprime mortgages that weren't regulated, that weren't in the regulated financial services market? So th that's number two. We've got to make the, what I, what I sort of call it is a single point of regulatory contact. I mean, why do I have to deal as a financial institution with 150 regulators? <laughs> you know, Give me one contact. I'll, I'll work with them and I'll do what I have to do. Um, and then we have to level the playing field. Easy example. How come Meta can issue Diem, its digital currency, by simply just satisfying some money transmitter laws in, in the States? And if a bank wants to do something like that, it has to go through a whole number of hoops with regulators. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and well, let me, let me, I, I want to interject a little bit here. So but a bank, a bank holding company could get a money transmitter license and 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 do the same thing, right? As yeah, uh, yeah. Well, but but a bank holding company is under the regulation of the Federal Reserve Board, so there's prudential regulation there. Well, uh, yeah. in 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 uh, fundamentally, because there's capital requirements, liquidity requirements, and well, that's terminations. True. There is there is that extra thing, right? which is which is why um, yeah, the, the the Toomey bill would have a new. OCC charter, which who knows who knows what the regulations go along with that, but presumably uh, they would uh, they would have to account for the fact that the the stablecoin issue were 100 uh, percent backed with um, in Caitlin's view it would be Federal Reserve uh, right, reserves right. of the Fed, uh, other people liquid assets, and that's to be debated. Um, can you can you wrap up here quickly, Tom, and we'll yeah. see if we can get Mona back I, on the line. I, I, I have two points here. It'll take me a minute. Uh, on stable coins, uh, number one, 
Uh, I, I agree with Caitlin. I think cash is is king in that world simply because of all of the very difficult. And I represented people in the payments and settlement systems for 40 years. I mean, it, it as Caitlin suggests, it's a maze of spider webs that really only a few people in this country, I think, and I don't include myself, really understand. Um, and, and if we can fix that and make it better, the world will be better generally. But uh, stable coins uh, are, are a problem. All you have to do is read the Bloomberg expose on Tether uh, and about who runs Tether, and then read the CFTC order fining Tether for really not having the backing that they suggest. Now, when we talk about backing, everybody talks sort of generally and not in legalese. Backing to me means collateralized, secured, perfected. None of that's going on, right? In most cases, it's just assets on the balance sheet that we hope will be there in the value that's been stated. Well, we know now, at least in Tether's case, that wasn't true. Last point, controlling entities. I was at the controller of the currencies office when the Change in Bank Control Act was passed, and I wrote the regulations at the OCC, and it was fundamental at that point to know who's controlling a bank. And therefore, there's a litmus test. There's a, an evaluation of management and directors and controlling shareholders. Nobody can just walk up and take control of a bank in this country. You have to pass through an enormous number of, of thresholds and tests. Well, not the case with stable coins or any other cryptocurrency. Anybody, anybody can literally start these things. So the question is going to be control again. And, and I'll, I'll stop here with a, a quote from the Bloomberg report on Tether when it talked about what it found in, in, its, in, its, in that system. It said, there's a number of coins being transferred by Inspector Gadget's Bahamian Bank in exchange for digital tokens conjured by the Mighty Ducks guy, all under the watchful eye of executives who were targets of a U.S. criminal investigation. Well, if that's where we are in the financial services business and that's innovation, count me out. <laughs> These are all good points. We'll get back. We'll go back and discuss them. Thank you very much. It is 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 Una back online? No, I thought she was. She was briefly, oh. but then uh, she fell back off again. Oh, here she comes yeah, again. She comes. Great. There she is. Are you there? You're muted right now, Una. We can't hear you. Oh no, she fell back uh, off. Okay. So, okay, we'll we'll take up this discussion. Um and hopefully she'll make it back. But but Caitlin, and your your model um Looks a lot like the narrow bank, Jamie McAndrews yeah. narrow bank proposal. Um, you want to you want to be able to have a master count and hold reserves at the Fed to back your state, but you're not you're not going to be in the business of having deposits. You're going to have they could be transferred over the banking payment system. You're going to be issuing stable coins. Uh, so, how is the Fed? What what's how is the Fed going to to square this kind of circle or circle the square when you know they were really uncomfortable with TNB the narrow bank uh, and and said that you know Jamie's Jamie who was a senior vice president in the New York Federal Reserve for twenty years or something you know that he was he was a systemic risk to the banking system um, maybe maybe you maybe you have a few words you can share with us on that. Well, first of all, we're not like the narrow bank at all. It's a completely okay. different business model. And that was a pass-through investment entity, as I understand it. And our, our business model is specifically designed not to be a pass-through investment entity. The, uh, as I recall, the Fed's uh, rules on that were promulgated but never, never enacted. But we comply with those. It's a completely different business model. And the whole idea is we're not a we're not passing through interest on reserves, which is as, as I understood the business model yeah, was, was in that. So it's it's really quite different. Yes, we are taking deposits. We are depository institutions. We have been interpreted by uh, the the legal division of the Federal Reserve to be a depository institution. We wouldn't have had a 
uh, wouldn't have been been given an ABA master account or ABA uh, routing number had we not been determined to be a depository institution. So uh, you could have discerned that by looking at public information, but I can confirm that. Um, so, but is sta stable coins are a deposit then? They are. Yeah. yeah. So our business is, is taking U.S. dollars. We're, we're about to launch with ACH and Fedwire, plain old U.S. dollar deposits and, and payments, uh, but then also handling Bitcoin custody and then the Abbott stablecoin and uh, services related to uh, to both of those. So it's a, it, it is a, a, a from a crypto perspective, uh, this there's really only one centralized cryptocurrency and it's Bitcoin. Most of the others, really all, almost all of the others are not decentralized. They're just variations on different things. And indeed, several of them are outright scams. That's very clear. So I'll set that aside. Bitcoin is the one that, that, that we are focused on. Uh, and then, then the US dollar uh, instrument is not a stable coin. It's actually a digital cashier's check. It's structured under UCC Article 3, for those of you who are familiar with how cashier's checks work. Uh, it's just the cashier's checks are paper. And, uh, and our, we use existing law to create a digital version of a cashier's check that happens to use the, the back end blockchain technology, but it's very different on the front end. It's issued, first of all, by a regulated bank. And, and second, uh, it's, it's, it's a cashier's check, which is a dollar. And you've got to be a bank to be able to issue a dollar. Uh, so, well, yeah. I mean, well, maybe. Um, I mean, you can... Traveler's checks, uh, which are similar to cashier's checks, which are similar to bank letters of credit, they're they're not deposit instruments. They're prepaid prepaid value instruments. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, and um, and and essentially, you're issuing a prepaid value instrument that ha just happens to trade over the blockchain. Or yeah, it, anyway. it's not structured legally like that. I get your point that there are that the prepaid uh, instruments business. That's how a lot of fintechs were able to yeah. to get into the back door into the banking business. But that's not what we're doing. This is a full fledged negotiable instrument that's that's that must be issued by a bank. So there's nothing out there like it. And to be clear, we haven't issued it yet. Uh, we're okay. we're in the process of getting open. We will be launching. Uh, with a partner bank while we're waiting for our, for our FedMaster account initially, and uh, that's coming in the span of weeks. Do do you have to get deposit insurance, federal deposit insurance, or are you chartered in a way that you don't? That's not required. It's chartered in a way that that's not required, and that's a that that was by design because yeah. the FDIC the the problem that the state of Wyoming set about to solve was that the FDIC started questioning the banking industry across the board in the fall of 2017. And in fact, actually, it happened in the previous bull market. Bitcoins go through four-year cycles. And the, there was a debanking cycle in 2013, a debanking cycle in 2017, and then um, now we're having one again um, that's, that, that's, that's spreading into, into uh, 2022. And what happens is that the bank regulators have deemed this to be a high-risk industry. So when the banks do their risk assessments, Essentially, it means that it doesn't mean they can't service this industry, but what it means is that they really can't be tourists in this industry because it's uh, it, it, it'll get them dinged by their regulators in their camel score uh, in their next supervisory exam. So most banks actually got out of this industry in, in 2017. And, uh, and so that specifically was what the state of Wyoming was solving for. If the FDIC, which by the way, I agree with the FDIC substantively. I, you've seen me say that I don't think crypto should be intermingled with the deposit insurance funds. And the big reason for that isn't, it, it's nothing wrong with crypto. It's because the settlement characteristics of crypto and the traditional financial industry are totally different. And absolutely, there is bank run risk that is injected into this, the system by plugging these two systems together in the wrong way. And we're seeing it right now. I've, I've, I've pointed out, um, in addition to community banks holding deposits for stable coins, we just saw a stable coin collapse in the span of hours, right? And community banks engage in maturity transformation. They don't hold a lot of excess liquidity. So that's a problem where, where you could get leakage into the deposit insurance fund right now today. Another one is that dozens, if not hundreds of community banks and credit unions are lending against Bitcoin. They're making Bitcoin back loans to, to what Tom was, was talking about. Some of this leverage in the industry is actually sitting in, in insured depository institutions right now. 
And I've spoken out against against that as well. If the if the if the custodian is hacked, the loss given default on those loans is a hundred cents on the dollar, and the and the insured deposit the deposit insurance funds would be picking that up. It's not appropriate for traditional banks to be engaging in these activities. It, the 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 the, the so-called Overton window in Washington, D.C. is now moving towards we've got to ring fence this stuff. It really is different. It's not just a, a new asset class. It's a new asset class with very different characteristics that don't mix well with uh, traditional systems. And they and, and it does need to be ring fenced. And so it, it, what what's what's fun is to watch that so-called Overton window now now moving towards where Wyoming has been. We've seen that happen before. Um, with the Uniform Law Commission, they originally were very critical of Wyoming passing a Uniform Commercial Code appendix to interpret the existing UCC for digital assets. And with 18 months, they had done a U-turn and were, were now there's a, a UCC Article 12 specifically for digital assets that is built on the concepts that, in, that Wyoming first enacted. And they publicly saluted Wyoming for being the pioneers in this thought process. We're now seeing that happen with the special purpose bank charter. That does seem to be where the Overton window is moving, a, a recognition that it does need to be plugged into the Fed somehow, but it has to be done in a, in a way that doesn't create safety and soundness problems. And how do you do that? You don't insure it. You don't allow it to have access to the discount window. You don't allow it to have daylight overdrafts. Those are the kinds of things that that makes sense for how to plug these two systems together without causing problems for the traditional one. Tom, do you, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think Caitlin has made some excellent points and they, they are, they are sort of ground zero in terms of understanding all of this stuff. Um, I have some concerns that the commingling of the crypto business and the banking business no matter how you do it through special purpose firewalls or whatever it is, there's going to be contamination. Uh, and so you, fundamentally you have to decide how investing in something, whether it's money or not, I don't, I don't know if crypto is really money. It purports to be money, but whether you're investing in something, as you said, that has no intrinsic value uh, and, and has a, a, a run risk attached to it because of that, how you integrate the bank and the stable coin or the crypto is extraordinarily delicate and, and takes an awful lot of time and effort and, and analysis. And I don't know that we've done all of that, uh, at least not what I've seen in terms of some of the regulatory pronouncements and some of the legislative proposals. I don't think we're anything close to understanding where we're going. And I also think that we're we're using vernacular and lexicon that comes from 1932 to 1940. But the other issue that it sort of strikes me here, and, and hearing Caitlin talk so uh, terrifically on these points, is the whole juxtaposition of the dual banking system in this country. You have to ask yourself, what's the future of a dual banking system in a world where there's no borders? Right. Because <laughs> I, we, we've seen it with the uh, interest rate exportation cases and everything else. I mean, there are no borders in cyberspace. And so the question becomes, what's the role of the states in that environment and how should the federal government re relate to the states? Now, there are upsides and downsides. The, the upside is that we've seen the states be sandboxes for all kinds of innovations, such as credit cards where South Dakota and Delaware took the lead in, in developing a credit card expertise and the staff to regulate a credit card expertise. And Wyoming appears to be out in front of there also. But the fact of the matter is that most states don't have the expertise and the resources in a lot of areas to be able to do that. So that's number one uh, in terms of understanding where we go with the dual banking system. But I, I worked on a uh, I chaired a, uh, a committee in, in the 1990s on jurisdiction in cyberspace, and we put out a report that included 20 countries around the world participating in trying to decide how you determine jurisdiction in cyberspace. Because at that point in time in the world, remember, every statute and every regulation said you have to look to the written contract. 
And of course, contracts weren't written anymore, right? And you need a wedding signature. Well, we didn't have wedding signatures. And so all the laws became obsolete overnight when we went into cyberspace. And that's what's happening here. We are effectively leapfrogging over years and years of tradition and laws and, and ways of doing things. And where we land is important because how we land and where we land is going to determine how safe and secure the system is. And I'm just concerned that we, and when I say we, I mean everybody, businesses, individuals, users, Congress, regulators, are all being mesmerized by technology. There's a certain, certain euphoria from technology, from opening up a new technological product. There's a certain euphoria that comes with that. It seems to be overwhelming everybody's best instincts about evaluating the risks and evaluating the safety and soundness. And I'm just concerned that, that we have to get that balance back to the center because I think it is totally focused today on innovation being the king and safety and soundness being second. And that is, that is frankly, not the right balance. So um, before, before we go on here, um, let me just say to the audience, uh, if you could put up where you send your questions again, we're going to be turning to audience questions here shortly. And it, there's a little bit of a time lag for them to type them and get them up. So let me, let me ask a question. So th this is sort of uh, picks up on your point there, Tom, and um, it's sort of a back to the future question. So the Wyoming legislature recently, uh, both houses passed uh, legislation that would allow the state to issue its own currency, its own stable coin. And, and the governor vetoed it um, because he said he just didn't think the state tre treasurer was, you know, really up to the up. It wasn't staffed or capable of really managing a, a stable Wyoming coin to issue it. But there are cities that issue city coins. We're kind of we're kind of going back to the future here on this stuff. Is this is this a good? I mean, think of the state chartered banks and state deposit insurance systems that have failed over the past centuries and all this is this is this really a good idea for states to states and cities to charter their own their own private currencies and thinking they're gonna you know make a buck uh, off the interest on their reserves or, or what, whatever they're thinking um caitlin what you're from wyoming why don't you yep. why don't i give you first go here uh, I'll say, first of all, I wasn't involved in that. That was an initiative I wasn't of several legislator, legislators. <laughs> uh, I stayed neutral. But um, what I they did call me at one point and said, if this is going to pass, you know, how do we do this? And I said, I, I think the only way you could fit it in is to make it a muni bond. Um, and it would be a non-interest bearing muni bond and it would just be essentially a tokenized muni bond. So let's see when they come back and um, what they end up doing it as because that's essentially what the what the city coins have been they're 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 really just tokenized muni bonds uh and and there's nothing wrong with that for sure um but picking up on the on the concept of of states what's fascinating to me is that the federal agencies do not have innovation in their remit some of them have innovation offices but they're not typically that it's not in their mission statement that they have to support innovation but here's the huge difference state regulators, it is in their mission statement that they have to support economic development. This is why you tend to get the innovations that bubble up from the states. The federal government is in incentivized to be allergic to all of this. Um, and, and it's not part of their mission, so they don't have to pay attention to it. But that's not true uh, of the states. Uh, and, and certainly in the case of Wyoming, Wyoming did it right. Um, it, 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 it it took the time to do the legislative drafting, as well as then two different rulemaking processes that had dozens of people involved in the public rulemaking processes. Not a lot of people were paying attention at that point, except for the digital asset industry. But uh, uh, it, it was a, a fulsome public process to create these rules, the first ever in the United States. And they've stood the test of time. And then the supervisory exam manual was drafted in consultation with Promontory, and it's something like 770 pages. 
Um, so there's a lot of substance there. And again, nobody's really pointed out anything major. There have been refinements that the state has, has made in response to some of the critics, but nothing major. And um, it's standing the test of time for sure. And, and it has been, it was funny when the OCC contacted the state of Wyoming for the supervisory exam manual. That was a nice moment for the Wyoming mm -hmm. Division of Banking because that's probably the first time that's ever happened, but it did happen. And that's substantive. Yeah, Paul. Two points. One uh, on Caitlin's point, and uh, and that is the state's incentive to 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 pursue economic development and innovation, and also take risk in doing so. The reason why in the banking business that's always been there traditionally is because of the sort of perverted way the banking system is built. And I mean by that, state banks can fail, but the federal government picks up the tab, right? So. So the state has no skin in, in that particular game, right? The skin is all with the FDIC that picks up the tab on the failed bank. Now, get to go to your point on Back to the Future, you are exactly correct on, being, on this going back to the future. We have been where we are going. It's called wildcat banking, when the banks all issued banknotes and bridge, bridges issued wooden niggles to be used to, to go across the bridge. I mean, there's tons and tons of cases and tons and tons of history written about this. There's the Stamp Payments Act of 1863 that said no, that it's illegal. It's illegal to create any coin token or thing of value in the denomination of less than $1 unless it's the United States government creating it. Who's using that law? Nobody right now. There's the Glass-Steagall Act, which we pulled out in the 1980s to use on the money market funds and said that what they were doing was effectively creating deposits that weren't insured and therefore were a criminal violation under Section 21 of the Glass-Steagall Act. That's been rolled out a little bit today. But the fact of the matter is uh, there are all these things in the history of this country, which, I, as I say, seem to be in the background because of the mesmerization of, of the technology business. And so, you know, we've been where we are going. And that is multi-currencies, interoperability problems, value prob problems. Remember with, with Wildcat Notes, depending on how far away you got from the bank issuer, it had a different value, right? And so we've been there. What created the, the, uh, the uniformity and the uh, system that allowed the Industrial Revolution to take off in this country and for the economy to take off, it was when the government started issuing currency. The Federal Reserve came into, into existence, and we had a stable form of currency. So, from a historical point of view, you can't miss that that uh, comparison in terms of the stability we, uh, issued and created by a federal form of currency that is backed by a government. At the end of the day, there's no cryptocurrency backed by anybody. Right? You can argue about stable coins and how they're backed and whether they're backed, but Bitcoin is backed by nobody, no government. And there are many people who will say that's its beauty, no government interference. I'll tell you what, wh when times get bad and it's in distress, that's not going to be its beauty. Yeah, they'll, 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 they'll want the government to intervene. And <laughs> well, I don't, know if, I don't know if you've seen the articles... <laughs> I don't know yeah, if you've I've seen, seen the articles this meet this week about asking for yeah. a government bailout on some of the stablecoin issues. Yeah, that wasn't well. I think it was the founders that said they would try to bail them out. I don't know there, if there were calls for government bailouts yet, but it wouldn't shock me. But let me let me and Caitlin, you you didn't like my comment, but sorry, you can weigh in a second. But let's let's move it a little bit. Uh, central bank digital currency, good idea, bad idea. Is it a substitute for stablecoins? Is it it's something entirely different? Um, should we go there or not go there? Uh, Caitlin, why don't you, I'll let you tee that up first. How does, how does that interact with your business model and, and what you want to do? And, and, and what are your views on that? Well, um, the, the Fed has not been historically the most innovative in technology. Some of that is deliberate. A lot of that is the fact that the, that, that a small number of uh, Fed approved bank integrators were required by every single bank in this country to be chosen as a as a what's called a banking core system and the, the method by which the banks integrate with the Fed. And if we look back on the history of that, that caused the payment system to atrophy. 
because when you create a monopoly, guess what those monopolists do? They're, they're fat and happy. And, and um, there's a big issue in the banking industry where those companies, and you'd know them as FIS, Fiserv, Jack Henry, et cetera, um, have a basically monopoly power to force their customers into five to seven year contracts. When you've got a five to seven year contract, what incentive do you have to keep up with technology? And that's one of the big reasons why the U.S. has not kept up with the open banking and API based technology systems that Asia and especially Europe have. And so um, I, I think with that backdrop, expecting a, a deliberately slow moving technology platform to, to, to basically lead in open banking is just not realistic. Uh, there are a lot of other reasons why it, it doesn't make sense. And frankly, I don't think the Federal Reserve would want that, um, that, uh, that, that position, especially when it comes to retail. Um, it, it, it only serves banks right now and the biggest of the banks in many cases. Um, but having to serve, you know, 350 million retail Americans and doing all the KYC and customer service related to that, plus all the businesses, it's, it's, uh, it would be a staggering change. And uh, realistically, I don't think it will happen. I, I agree with you, Tom. Tom, you, you, I know you have opinions on this too. Yeah, um, I've thought a lot about it, and um, I think the Fed has to answer six questions in moving forward on CBDC. Uh, I mean, there's an overriding question, and that is, is it a, is it a solution looking for a problem? And I leave that to the Fed because I know they're they're thinking about that, and I know a number of Fed governors have made speeches, including Randy Quarles, have made speeches about that. But I think there's six questions that the Fed has to answer uh, before it moves forward on an ECBDC if it's going to do it at all. Number one, what's the impact on monetary control and the economy? Number two, what's the impact on privacy? A lot of privacy advocates are concerned about the government indirectly or directly gathering all that information through CBDCs. Number three, does it disintermediate the banks in any way? And if so, we ought to know what that means and whether the, the account is going to be through the Fed, through the bank, through a, uh, through a, a wallet that the, uh, the bank issues with CBDC, how that's going to happen, how it's going to affect or, or disintermediate banks from deposits. N number four, what's the impact on economic capital formation and liquidity in this country? When you move money around, you change systems like that, there is an impact. It may not be immediate and it may be long term, but there's an, and there's an impact on the economy. Number five, what's the impact on credit availability? If the Fed is issuing deposits, does that mean banks don't have those deposits? Does that mean banks don't have those deposits to turn into loans? And number six, which I think is the most important factor, the one I've mentioned to the Fed folks working on this over and over again is you have to determine that whatever system you're creating is 100% secure. Because if it's not, it will be the number one hacked instrument on the face of the planet. No one will try to hack anything more than a Federal Reserve CBDC, whether it's just to disrupt it or to take the money. And so you have to know that it's going to be absolutely secure. And then the question becomes long-term security, because as you and I have talked in the past, with quantum computers coming in, uh, at some point, maybe, at some point, they will eradicate and change the digital security that we use today overnight. So, um, Caitlin, um, you, you were... Um... I learned a lot from you in discussions in the past and, and talk to, to me a little bit why uh, our system is so bad, our, our existing payment system. How come it can't evolve to, to do things like these application program interfaces that this seems to be, um, the blockchain seems to be just, just way better for doing things like that. Um, what in the existing system, there's no hope that, that or with Fed, Fed modernizing payments that they're they're not going to they're not going to move ahead with those kinds of things. What's what's the lay of the land there? Well, the lay of the land is the the back end of our payment systems are atrophied. They are using old technology. Most of them don't even have these APIs, application programming interfaces, which are which are now the prerequisite of 
of connectivity in the internet. And they've been around. This is the European Payment System Directive. This they've been the European banks have been using those and making them available to their customers for years now. And the vast majority of the quantity of U.S. banks don't have APIs at all. And this gets back to the banking cores. Uh, most banks don't have their own technology teams, and so they have to buy it. And if they're buying it from an approved integrator and those approved integrators have been fat and happy and not upgraded their systems, well, now you end up with what we have. Uh, so what we've done in the US as a result, and this gets back to Tom's great points about 35% of the industry being regulated, the, the technology innovation went into the, the fintech industry. It went into the front end. And, it, and most people, if, they, if you use Venmo or PayPal um, or Zelle, you, you think you're getting a real-time payment because um, when you send it, it ends up, if you're splitting dinner with your friends, it ends up in, in their account seemingly right away. But it's, it's a Ferrari front end, but a horse and buggy back end. Um, and there's an awful lot of cost and, and the cost of tied up capital. Just the latency ties up all this working capital in the, in the financial system on the back end. And if we had APIs, you're right, Paul, it, we would not have, the, 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 the lure of blockchain would not have been as strong as it is if we had better payments. It's because our payments in the U.S. are so backwards that, that there's, there's demand for this. And um, if we'd kept it up, then, then it would have been great. I do worry about the community banks who are stuck with these five to seven year contracts, typically with these backwards technology platforms um, when FedNow comes on online. Because even if we leave aside crypto and, and even if it were never invented, FedNow is coming, right? The real-time um, payments initiative has been in, underway at the Fed for years now. And it, it's going to create the same issues. Uh, the, the, the traditional banking cores update books and records once a day. Well, if FedNow is 24-7, 365 and settles in minutes, you could very easily have a bank run happen intraday and the bank wouldn't even know until it, it updated its books and records overnight. They need API-based systems in order to be able to update intraday. The Fed itself has capability for real-time monitoring of banks with master accounts, but most banks do not, not even remotely close. The big banks do, the ones that have invested in their own technology platforms, of course, all have APIs. Although when we look at the APIs of even the biggest banks, there's a philosophy that has infected the U.S. financial system, which is build walled gardens and build really complicated proprietary systems so that we can sort of capture the, the economics. Um, and, and one of the things about the Internet is it's breaking those barriers down, whether you go to full decentralization like Bitcoin or whether you just have more open systems, it's breaking those barriers down. And, 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 and the reason why Stripe is so successful it, with its famous in API and eight lines of code, it's super simple and it's designed to create big network effects. And uh, our former CTO once said, and I think he's right, there's no reason Stripe should exist. If, if the banks had been doing their job in the United States and upgrading their technology, Stripe would not need to exist. And it's because they don't that we have all of this activity in fintech, which is sitting in state licensed money transmitters, which, by the way, themselves are literally narrow banks without capital. That is what a state licensed money transmitter is. It's a, it, it has certain permitted investments and they're essentially cash and high quality liquid investments. Um, and they're not capitalized like a bank. And so we've pushed all this activity into fintech. And it is because of the atrophy in technology that that happened in the banks. Tom? Yeah, Paul, I mean, I, I could not uh, support what she what Caitlin said any stronger. Uh, I mean, she just gave you, a, I think, a fabulous assessment of how financial services has evolved or devolved in this country over the years. Let me let me draw a line under that and give you one example that sort of makes her Caitlin's point. Um, when I was working at the Cyberspace Law Committee as chairman in the late 90s, um, we learned that the chip card technology existed somewhere around 1995 meaning we could have inserted chips into credit cards to reduce the fraud because chips are not, the chips in the cards are not uh, impenetrable, but they're a lot more secure than a mag stripe on the back of a credit card. And so we could have reduced fraud by putting uh, chips in credit cards in the late 1990s. When did it happen? It happened by law in 2015. 
right? That's when we started doing it. Now, why didn't it happen when the technology was there? Well, reason number one is what Caitlin's saying. The, the back-end processing was so complicated. Nobody wanted to replace the point-of-sale terminals. Nobody wanted to replace their, uh, their uh, software. When I say nobody, it's not just the banks, the issuers, the merchants. It's also the merchants and the processing people also because there's a lot of capital infrastructure in the status quo. The status quo is an enormously uh, huge detriment when it comes to technology and innovation. And because of all those things, and I guess the, 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 the main factor was, in some cases, fraud in the, in the credit card business ends up uh, being paid for by the users in a higher interest rate being charged to the credit card users. So it's a self-sustaining system. And the question is, what's the incentive to, to reduce fraud? Well, it wasn't until the government required that that well, happen. If recollection serves, there was some major hack of a retailer too, I think. Yes. That, that sort yes. of pushed, pushed. Let yes. That's when the hacks really became uh, so stunningly frequent. We, we have like one second left. So, um, so, so there, there, there's no hope that, um, the, the, ex, the executive branch could come out and study this and come to the conclusion that, hey, we really got a problem with the payment system processing industry and we need to push them to modernize an API. I mean, that would, would that be a good outcome if the government, if the whole of government study of uh, stable coins, crypto asset and all that, would that, would that be a good outcome, you think? If, well, uh, let me let me give you a short answer to that. So in the new book I'm writing, which is called The Unhackable Internet, uh, I, I documented in the appendix 90 reports done by governmental agencies, international groups since since 2000 and I'm um, since 1996, um, starting with the Clinton administration, which really understood the Internet quite succinctly. But there's about 90 reports that I uh, include in an appendix and I talk about in the book. Uh, if and I read all 90 reports by every agency, you know, every alphabet suit you can think of. It's the same thing over and over again for 25 years. Identification of issues, innovation, technology, something should be done maybe sometime. 25 years. I mean, we've wasted 25 years doing government reports that got us absolutely nowhere. That has driven me to conclude that if we really want substantive long-term change, if we really want substantive long-term cybersecurity, if we really want long-term improvements in this area, it's going to have to be driven by the business sector and the business sector saying to Congress, here's what we need. And of course, consumers and users are going to have to be in that dialogue too. But it's got to be driven by that group. It can't be driven by the government. It won't get there. Those, those are good closing words, Tom. We're at five. Caitlin, you got got a couple minutes to sum up here. Uh, well, I'll, I'll go back to the the question of of crypto and say, uh, you know, the state of Wyoming has been working on this for a while. I know it's. Uh, I know it's perceived to be a, a small state uh, that's not as, you know, it's not New York, right, from a state financial regulator perspective, but go dig in and see what Wyoming did. And we've been at this and, and, and the, we're being shown to have been right in Wyoming. And uh, my bank is trying to get the door open for everybody else uh, at, at the Fed. Uh, the Fed has had our business plan for two years now. To, to literally issue our digital cashier's check, which would function like a stable coin from a technology perspective. Um, and, I, and, I, and, and we haven't had an answer in two years. And I wonder, uh, posit, what would have happened to the market had a regulated approved version of that been out there already? Would we have had so many people hoodwinked by the Ponzi scheme of the anchor protocol last week? It's a yeah. question for everybody to ponder. Well, I, I, I'm sorry we lost Una along the way. Uh, hopefully um, we can have her to date in the future. I wanna thank both of you. You're such great uh, panelists, such great guests. I learned a whole lot from both of you and uh, I hope you enjoyed the session today. So uh, thanks. And I guess that wraps up uh, our AEI policy event for today. Paul, thank you to you, thank AEI you. and to Caitlin. Likewise, what an honor. Appreciate it.